What you are hearing, folks, is for the first time in history the public revelation of the origin, the history, the dogma, and the identity of those who operate in secret to bring about a worldwide totalitarian socialist government. They are known to Christians as Mystery Babylon. It is an ancient religion. Those of you who are smart enough to know what is transpiring here know that these are historic broadcasts. And by making these broadcasts, I have sealed my fate. Hey, welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Uh, I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the Self Breeders Paradise. Uh, to learn all about this burgeoning parallel network, uh, check out the website, Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com, uh, or check out the last episode of this podcast with Kyle. Uh, that's vonniepodcast.com forward slash 218. Uh, VonniFest 5, our premier event on self-liberation, begins next month. Absolutely crazy to think about. Uh, the official dates are September 30th to October 7th. Uh, some liberated nomads will be out there for the full gathering uh, or longer, uh, but many will come out come for the weekend. Uh, usually, there's an overall theme that I promote, but this year I've been I've been focusing my energy and efforts uh, on bringing together a handful of folks uh, who are building the new when it comes to breakthrough energy, uh, whether mobile applications like cars or vans, uh, as well as off grid solutions for homesteaders. Uh, the first official announcement I can make is that Matt Presti, uh, former president of Walter Russell's University of Science and Philosophy, uh, will be in attendance for the weekend uh, and will even be hosting a talk on Friday evening uh, or sometime uh, Saturday. Uh, for those unfamiliar, Walter Russell in the early 1960s demonstrated the efficacy of his optic dynamo generator powering a 52-room uh, huge university uh, for a month. Uh, Walter donated the invention to the U.S. government uh, as a demonstration of something miraculous that could change humanity forever uh, in the best way possible. And, uh, of course, the U.S. government did not uphold their end of the deal uh, and make it public. Uh, rather, the prototype now sits at the University of Virginia, along with the literal truckloads of art uh, that Walter and La uh, Leo Russell created during their lifetimes. Uh, again, he was an artist. He wasn't even really—he wasn't even a scientist when it started, uh, when he kind of began this journey. But um, anyway, Matt will be here to give a talk, uh, discuss Russell, and hopefully some breakthrough energy. And uh, as anyone else in attendance will do, uh, soak up the freedom of the second realm. Uh, and the second uh, official announcement— uh, for Vonifest, uh, Paul Rosenberg, author of A Lodging of Wayfaring Men, uh, former proprietor of Crypto Hippie, uh, the best VPN formerly on the market, and a uh, legendary cypherpunk crypto anarchist. Uh, we'll be here for the Monday of Vonifest. Again, just the Monday. I'm not exactly sure when he's going to arrive. Um, September 30th. Uh, later in the week, he'll be heading off to Hackers Congress in Prague, uh, hence the short visit. Um, but if you can make it out early, uh, come have a chat with Paul, uh, chew and, a chat and chew with Paul, or a chew and chat with Paul. I'm calling it one of those two. I hope I promoted it before. Uh, depending on his arrival, uh, we'll prepare either a small, uh, intimate lunch or dinner for any Pazians in attendance. It's just probably just going to be five, six people. Um, it'll be, yeah, just, uh, um, yeah, really, really incredible, um, you know, uh, incredible, uh, you know, event uh, with Paul, very small event. But, uh, yeah, if you're interested in coming out and you are currently unvetted, uh, please send me an email, coordinator at paznia.com. Uh, or DM on SimpleX or Telegram. Uh, we do want as many high-caliber individuals as possible, uh, but we have to be assured in some fashion that they have forsworn uh, the use of coercion. Uh, again, coordinator at paznia.com uh, or DM on SimpleX or Telegram. Uh, this is a Vonnie Fest you don't want to miss. Uh, so, Kyle, um, rather going to be recording with you again, I guess, on, on that note. Um, yes. Yeah. I guess uh, I know that the tumultuous nature of this year, of the past year, hasn't slowed down. Um, but I guess to get on the record, and I'm, I'm curious too, uh, I guess, how's it looking? Uh, um, you think you might be able to make out to Bonnie Fest this year? Unfortunately, I uh, regret to say that this year is not going to be possible, mainly because I am now accumulating debt faster than I can pay it off. Last time I checked, I'm actually five figures in debt now. Okay. Um, gotcha. And it's okay. It's okay. I am, just want to be clear with everybody. I am not requesting financial assistance at this time. I'm okay. This isn't like what happened uh, before, where that was, that was a very different situation. Um, the long and the short of it, folks, is that I'm trying to set up for right now a first realm business that once that client list is stable and I got money rolling in, 
I'll use that to get out of debt, and then I want to start seeing if I can start investing in something more of a second realm nature. Uh, but the main thing is I have got to get away from working for employers, for bosses, and making other people rich. That has to stop. I need to find a different way to sustain myself financially, pay my bills, and so forth that doesn't rely on being a W-2 employee or, as I am now, a 1099 contractor. I need to stop doing that. So I'm in a transitionary phase right now, and unfortunately, I cannot afford to go on a road trip. However, that being said, I would be open to some sort of call during Bonnie Fest or something like that where I get to, you know, people get to at least hear my voice at minimum. And then, of course, what I'm really looking forward to is next year's Bonnie Fest where it would be much more financially viable for me to, to head out to Illinois. And so I did want to say that publicly to everybody. Awesome. Awesome. No, and that makes sense. That's kind of what I figured. Um, yeah, I mean, it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. De- it was definitely a. Ma- it's always been a maybe for sure. Um, but yeah, like, things haven't really was, slowed it, down for it, you. It, so um, yeah, I, I, I understand. I definitely understand. Yeah. It, it, I appreciate that. And not just that, but this has been an absolutely crazy, insane year for me. Where last year for me looks completely different. Like my my immediate family is completely different. It's it's just a completely different situation. Um, I mean, not to go too deep into it, but as some, as some things have already been mentioned publicly, uh, right now I'm kind of going through the last phases of my divorce. So, um, in fact, I'm actually waiting to hear back from, from her lawyer um, because it, so far it's kind of looking like it's going to be a uh, non-contestable divorce, which means it's going to be simpler and faster. Um, so unless something happens at the last minute, hopefully the legal stuff of that uh, will will be over, and then um, and I don't know maybe maybe at some point I'll write an article where I'm kind of reevaluating the value of freemates, and not just what happened with me, but even some other people. I guess you could say in some support groups that we've had for divorced men or or, or single dads and so forth, we're really just kind of reevaluating a lot of things. Um, and it's not. And I want to be clear: this is not intended to be a bash against families or different family structures, but it's a reevaluation on some assumptions a lot of people have made because a lot of people's notions of romance, attachment, uh, so-called relationship theories, a lot of it's based on a lot of Hollywood propaganda. Let's just call, call it for what it is. A lot of it's based on propaganda. A lot of it's also based on what your, what your own familial relationships and qualities of those relationships were with your own parents and siblings. Because a lot of, you know, there's the old phrase about uh, people will essentially, (laughs) they will essentially date and screw and marry, in most cases, the opposite sex uh, version of their uh, parents. So, for example, if, again, in a heteronormative manner, uh, if you're a woman, you'll find, uh, you'll settle down with a man who most resembles your father. And if you're male, you'll, you know, the opposite kind of holds true, too, at least in terms of heterosexual relationships. So that's something I've just kind of noticed is there is a lot of assumptions, there's a lot of propaganda, and there's also a lot of like a very limited degree of lived experience based on your uh, people that are around you that where, where patterns seem to repeat themselves over and over again. But unfortunately, there's the mental health aspect of it. Um, people are not good, and unfortunately, I am one of these people. People are not good, except for very, very few at recognizing red flags and running away when they should. A lot of times people will ignore red flags for whatever reasons, and then only a couple years down the road, when things have already progressed a little too far, now they can just kind of feel stuck unless they get themselves extricated, right? So that's been a very tough lesson for me to learn. Um, Again, to be clear, not knocking families, not knocking even the notion of having children and so forth, but it's more... If the goal here is to become invulnerable to coercion or, or proceed along that spectrum, it's kind of counterproductive to, shall we say, do everything correctly when it comes to, or at least consciously effective. You know, do everything with different forms of shelter like we talked about in previous episodes, or do better forms of field prep, or even find good versions of whether it's employment or other wealth generation but then totally drop the ball 
completely and utterly when it comes to who you share your bed with. Because that is also known as shooting yourself in the foot. And I should know because I did it recently. So in that sense. So again, this is not me preaching down to anybody in the slightest. This is me saying I'm in the same thing, or at least was up until recently, in the same sinking boat as a lot of people who had failed relationships. You know, because hindsight's always 2020. So again, if the goal is proceeding, you know, becoming a uh, vulnerable, you know, uh, increasing that invulnerability to coercion, then you really got to watch out for those divorce attorneys. Got to really watch out for those family law courts because that's where the status part of it kind of uh, creeps back in, especially if your spouse decides to do something. And not only that, it's not even necessarily limited to marriage. It could also just be uh, if you had like a domestic partnership type thing and depending on certain residency, uh, depending on like, uh, shall we say, some degree of legal interstices, uh, there may or may not be, uh, you could call it a common law marriage or something else, but if there's any sort of legal entrapping if you were allowed to visit them in the hospital for whatever reason, if you have joint ownership of any sort of property like a car or a house or something, uh, or, or joint ownership of anything, uh, bank accounts would be an easy one, you know, joint bank accounts. Uh, a lot of those things may or may not affect your vulnerability to coercion. And so that's what I'm saying. I think I might write an article here soon, uh, kind of reevaluating a lot of that stuff because I don't think there's a one simple, easy answer to it at all. I think there's some people that are really better off just being completely, totally alone, like a hermit, an aesthetic, if you were, a monastic, if you will. And I think there are other people that due to their own personalities and, and previous life experience and so forth and preferences that really do need to share their life with somebody, including their bed. So that's why I think you know, we need to get away from this first realm Hollywood propaganda stuff, and we need to get away from right-wing notions, especially of nuclear family uh, being defined as 1950s era mom, dad, and you know, 2.5 children as the typical Protestant equivalent thing is. We need to get away from all that. Those are boxes, those are constraints that I would argue actually increase your vulnerability to coercion wholesale. And I've seen it happen with other friends of mine. Again, my own situation was a bit different, but still the same idea of like avoid, you know, not paying attention to the red flags, not taking your mental health seriously until something's already, you know, the, you know, the hammer comes down. Now it's quickly becoming an issue of are you going to pull through or not? Because people have self-terminated over stuff like this. I mean, a lot of the reason why their suicide rates among men is because, you know, they either lost somebody or somebody left them or something. I mean, this is like really serious, life-changing stuff. So, you know, if people are considering self-determination over, you know, whether they're in grief or one thing or not. I mean, it's like, oh, well, now I guess you coerced yourself to some degree. So, Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> gotcha. Well, um, I guess uh, to uh, – I was going to mention uh, Innovator um, alongside Vonnie Life and Vonnie Link. But, uh, yeah, Vonnie Life resurrected next year. Um, that would be a great article. Um, and that's, uh, you know, quite a ways away. Uh, we're talking like, um, yeah, six or seven months at least um, until the, uh, the, due, the quote unquote due date for those, uh, for that. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, relationships, that was definitely a, definitely a theme, um, definitely important. Um, which I was, as we talked about before, um, you know, usually the courses only come if they're called and they usually, they're only, they're only called if it's, uh, you know, uh, if you have no, nosy neighbors, it's obviously an exception, but a lot of times it's, you know, who you interact with, um, you know, it, who you choose to interact with in your personal life. Um, so yeah, you're, you're, you're certainly, certainly right to point that out. Um, but yeah, I was going to mention, uh, just, I guess one, a, 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 a digitization update for, uh, for folks. Um, I, uh, finished digitizing and formatting all of Innovator, uh, 1964 to, uh, I think 1969. And, uh, like Preform, Inform, uh, and Vonnie Life and Vonnie Link, uh, it will be, uh, it'll be close to 500 pages, uh, at full eight and a half by 11 size. So these are, um, I, I put out the, the way I put it on, on, uh, Twitter was, uh, these are like massive tomes on self-liberation. And uh, there's going to be like three or four of them. Um, like it's it'll be like an encyclopedia on Vanu. Um, so yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, that'll be a, you know it might be a couple years before that comes out. But um, anyway, um, just uh, thought I'd provide a digitization update there. And uh, that concludes, I guess, the main stuff. There might be some extraneous documents. Um, like uh, one thing we'll start talking about here momentarily, the Frowls Project. Um, that was those were just some documents that Jim Stump threw in there. Um, some of, I guess, the, uh, comp the competitive dispute resolution um, article uh, said preform confidentials. That might have only gone to like you know twenty, thirty people back in the back in the day in the sixties. 
but uh um yeah there's there's not gonna be anything else major digitized but uh you know maybe just some some i guess some interesting archival stuff um but anyway uh yeah on today's podcast uh we'll finally do another q a uh the first probably since uh 2019 uh when jason booth was still coast uh on the podcast uh, the first question uh, will be on the Free Alice Project uh, audiobook released in the past month or two. Uh, that's fawnypodcast.com forward slash 212. The second on a potential new legal, legal interstice uh, in the realm of uh, legal identification. Uh, the third, a proposal from someone I vet 100% on a new model, or I guess I guess some thoughts on private security. Uh, and we'll close out with some more basic foundational items, uh, digital privacy, kind of you know, digital, digital privacy, uh, operational security stuff. Um but uh, I guess uh, I'll mention here, uh, it's been after thinking about it for a little while, um, I will answer the, I guess, the first question uh, partially, but as far as the actual strategy, uh, the potential interstice, um, that will be saved for uh, for a select few people. So I got to go out to the public. Uh, and there w- that, uh, that question from, uh, I guess, I guess looking at private security uh, in the second realm, that kind of perspective, that will also be saved for um, the very end and will only be released to select number of people because I don't really want to release that stuff publicly. Um, at this time, uh, maybe you know, maybe not uh, ever, but we'll see. Uh, speaking of preform confidential stuff, we got some some volume podcast confidential stuff here. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's the way it's got to be. The way it's got to be. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, enough rambling. Uh, so, yep, yep. So, go for it, man. Go for it. So, so of the, so put or put another way. So of the stuff you can't talk publicly about. Dot dot dot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I guess let's let's go ahead. We yeah we're uh, you know limited. I guess not even not limited on time. We got time. We got, but uh, we'll go ahead and get moving here because I want to provide a little bit of a background on uh, the Free Alice project here. But uh, as far as the question, I'll, I'll preface it with this. Um, his uh, JJ asked uh, regarding TVP uh, TVP number two twelve uh, the Free Alice project material. Uh, with the discussion on market processes, in your mind, which is better, cooperation uh, or competition? So um, I will remind folks uh, that I'll get flipped over here on OBS so you can look at my screen here. Not you, Kyle, but for the, uh, the video viewers. Um, but yeah, uh, the Free Alice Project, oh, so I smacked my microphone. Uh, the Free Alice Project, an early 1960s exploration into seasteading, alternative dispute resolution, and voluntary governance. You can find that here at bonniepodcast.com forward slash 212. Uh, and the PDF is uh, um, available for download, and it will be released uh, in paperback format at some point. But uh, uh, anyway, just to give you, give you all uh, an idea of the table of contents here. Um, so an introduction to free aisles, which is what I'll, I'll cover just a little bit, out, little bit of and, and a little bit of an introduction. Uh, introduction summary to government and development organizations. Uh, the nature and proper use of elections, which was an article by Rayo, or I guess it was Tom Marshall back in those days. Um, I think it was Tom Marshall. I don't think it was Rayo. Um, Association yeah. of Free Isles. Okay. Um, Isle Development Corporation and Competitive Dispute Resolution are the uh, the contents here, and it's a, it turned out to be like a three three and a half hour audiobook, um, very extensive. I'm not sure like uh, so like as far as the Isle Development Corporation one um, and the GDO, the Government Development Organization stuff, a lot of that's like really boring and dense. Um, so I guess the summary, um, if you think about it in terms of like Pasnia, um, as we did a couple episodes ago with uh, you know like a, a, a parallel network. Well, this would just be like a parallel network of free isles, basically uninhabited ocean islands or um, uh, land that they could, uh, you know, maybe lease from a government, <clears throat> uh, things like that. Um, but they had a uh, pretty massive, um, you know, they were, I don't know, very much into ca- you know into capitalism. Um, so they made they laid they you know they uh, not that it's not a bad thing. It's just like they 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 had a very structured like businesses and stakeholders and um, like very very proper um, to the point of like. Yeah, just ex- ex- extreme detail, um, extreme detail. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll I can provide a, a little more, uh, a little more detail here. <clears throat> so uh, I guess just, uh, and I'm just gonna read read parts throughout this. I'm not gonna read any any near near the, the entire part of it because you guys can go check that out on your own. But uh, some assumptions: the free will be located 100 to 500 miles from a major metropolitan area. Uh, the principal or only means of transportation to the eye will be by water or air. Uh, there will be no natural resource of export value, such as mineral ore, timber, or naturally occurring ag- agriculture. Uh, the isle is initially undeveloped and has few, if any, uh, inhabitants. Um, so, yeah, small small population. The first settlers can achieve a high standard of living only by trading. Um, basically be reliant on upon import um, for, uh, you know, at the start. And uh, then a lot of these other opportunities come, um, you know, as, as the project gets bigger. Um, but let me see if there's uh, if there's anything else. 
<clears throat> yeah, initially a small market. Um, I guess uh, advantages like, uh, you know, import taxes are, you know, a huge strain on businesses. Um, obviously, if you have, like with uh, any sea setting venture uh, in international waters, um, you don't fall under uh, the pharmaceutical regulations. So, like, um, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical laboratories and things um, are huge. Uh, aquaculture, um, which is talked about uh, by Kerry Thornley. Um, oh, gosh. Kerry uh, Thornley and uh, the Permanent Floating Voluntary Society. Um can't go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess there's uh, basically just laying out uh, tourism as a possibility. Uh, and then even further on, um, which is when it gets into the extreme detail, like uh, how do you become a quote-unquote citizen of Free Isles? Um, you know, like how did the, uh, you know, how is it going to be funded? Um, you know, how do you deal with arbitration? How do you deal with dispute resolution? Um, all of those things um, that would be critical um, in this sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, I would definitely recommend uh, people check it out. But, um, like I said, I... Uh, Back to JJ's question. So there's uh, obviously the very, very, um, and I guess I could pull, pull up uh, <coughs> an example here. But yeah, it's uh, it gets, uh, so they've got a, a principia, which is the fundamental principles, um, which legally define, um, I guess, Association of Free Isles, the Constitution, which describes the organizational structure, the initiatory is a plan for initiating. So you've got kind of the founding documents and an actual plan for initiating and all sorts of stuff. But yeah, it gets it gets very, very into the weeds of breaking it up and especially, you know, what duties, what tasks, you know, what, um, you know, what they'll do. And it gets, yeah, kind of into the actual, you know, um, voting stuff. Um, it gets into that because, again, you've got to remember um, this is the this is the time of uh, Ayn Rand and um, it was about voluntary governance. There was no yeah, the, that was that's that's where it was. So you aren't going to escape that um, back in, you know, back in these days until Tom rebranded to Rayo. But uh, I guess uh, anyway, yeah, I guess cooperation or um, competition. Um, and I'll, I'll just I'll just start by uh, I guess by. By saying both, you know, it's it's kind of a cop out answer, but you know, I think it is both. Um, you know, I think there are some things that, uh, um, you know, competition um, is is you know hugely necessary, um, you know, to to bring out the best um, in whatever whatever area we're talking about. Um, so I think that's that's obviously something that has to, um, you know, it has to be there in some capacity. I don't think it has to be. It does that definitely has to be ruthless capitalism, like um, so called capitalism, like it is today. But um, yeah, it's it's certainly crucial, certainly crucial. Um, but I think the the, the cooperation part. Um, also is too, because there are some things that are, you know, better done, um, you know, I guess maybe better done in kind of like a, I don't know, maybe that, that's a mutual aid sort of community sort of sense. So, um, that's kind of my, uh, my answer. And, and I think a lot of the, uh, um, I don't know, maybe there's, maybe there's a, maybe there's a place for some of that. Uh, I mean, like the decentralized autonomous organizations today, um, that are talked about a lot, um, like the, the DAOs, um, this, I guess those would be a, a, a future model of this, maybe a digital version of this. Um, so, you know, um, I don't know, uh, like I, like I said, when, like, I guess, like I, uh, mentioned when I promoted it, um, I'm not sure how much of it is actually valued, like, I guess, um, um, you know, valuable today, um, uh, but just reading through and going through it, um, and looking at it from like a Pasnia lens, uh, was, was really valuable. Um, cause there are some things that could be taken away from it. Like there, you know, there's, there should be more, um, I don't know. There, it gave me a lot of ideas, at least, at least for Pasnia, but it, yes, as far as the overall, Overall thing, I'm not sure how much of it is is uh, is, is a value, but um, yeah, I get back to the question: cooperation versus competition. I think it's both. Um, I think it's it's definitely not one or the other. Um, but I don't know. I know you really haven't you haven't looked into I guess this book in, in specific, Kyle, or I guess these documents in, in particular. But um, you know, you've you've heard about them and read about them through various funny publications. But um, I guess regarding the like frows or seasteading, um, cooperation or competition, um, what do you think is you know preferable? So. I would phrase it like this because I think there's a nuance here that should be explored. Um, first of all, when you're talking about something like Free Isle, um, this is actually a lot more difficult, especially in terms of scalability, than anybody would kind of kind of care to admit. Uh, for fictional examples, I would say look at Bioshock's City of Rapture, and then in along the novel alongside Night, look at the underground city of Aurora. Um, I don't care if it sounds like I'm speaking out of turn, but to be quite honest, although, you know, art imitates life of, as life imitates art, I honestly don't think that the people who ran Rapture and Aurora respectively were caring too much about legality, to be perfectly honest. When you have an underwater city with the one and then an underground, or excuse me, underwater city with the one and then an underground city with the other, um, 
I think mainly unless they had some sort of like legal cover at something else, they were more concerned about economic issues and and also more practical engineering ones like how do you make sure that we all breathe underwater or underground as the case may be and also how do we make sure to keep the lights on and and you know water you know plumbing for the water and making sure that we have enough to eat and, and just basic stuff like that now that being said to answer the question i think what it, w- it what it would take to do something like that is that it would first have to be cooperation at first yep. because when you're building the when you're building what even the first realm would call the critical infrastructure um what's there to compete with right you you, you need some basic things to survive on uh, especially if it's something going to be kind of like a city or, or in this case a free aisle type thing w- you know whether you call it a private road or pl- or private uh, utilities like your plumbing and your electricity, or and it, you know telecommunications, your your internet, and so forth. Um, whatever your critical infrastructure utilities are, um, that stuff needs to kind of go up first, and make sure that it's done and done correctly. Whether it's with coax cable or, and whatever else, because if you're just assembling, you know, like with the plumbing, if you're just assembling a bunch of pipes and then duct taping it together, then the possibility for good-natured friendly competition later in order to increase, as we understand with market forces, to increase quality of service and drive down prices to the point where, you know, you know, good old fashioned demand and supply eventually uh, achieve equilibrium. Um, the only way that's really going to happen is if you actually, if the infrastructure is already there to begin with, right? If, if we're talking I'm about, sorry, if, we're ta- if we're talking essentially about designing a libertarian city, then cool. But, and I might even move, be one of the first people to actually live there. If, if nothing else, to escape my creditors, right? Hardy, har, har. I didn't really mean that if they're listening. Uh, or maybe I did mean it. But either way, um, how do I say this? You know, you've got to do things and do it right the first time, especially when it comes to like life support systems. Like, again, even if we were living on a fucking spaceship, same idea. The critical infrastructure has to be there or else we can't even exist to even be in conflict with each other if we chose to do so for some strange reason. So whether we're cooperating in competition or we're straight up having fist fights in a freaking way, some people do, I've seen happen, having fist fights in the parking lot, there's some basic uh, sustainment of life technology that we need to function. Um, Especially if it's in the context of something that's underwater, underground, or under whatever, under whatever. Um, now, once that's set up and hopefully done correctly, and that's that's the big if, then if you want to sell, you know, you want to say, you know, Acme Plumbing, and you know, next generation electricity, and uh, you know, Mario and Bros Internet or something, right? Um, then hopefully we can actually have some competition and yeah, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be some creative destruction going on as there should be at the same time though. Uh, if there's no infrastructure, there's nothing to compete over, right? There, there's very much a car, a, putting a car before the horse situation here. Yes. And, and if I can, yeah, let me, yeah, let me, let me reiterate. Cause you're, 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 all, yeah, you're, you're, you're on point. Yeah. You're, you're on point here in that it's not, um, it's not if it's not like uh, an or thing, it's, it's when, um, cooperation had to be first. Um, I just found um, in the in this document, and you, yeah, you, I mean, you basically are spelling out what's in the the Free Isles documents. But <clears throat> um, so there's no, po- there's yeah, obviously no police. There's uh, no no fees or tax. Like so, it's basically an entrepreneurial venture. But um, <clears throat> so services which tend, uh, which are essential prerequisites for economic development of the Isle, and which tend to be natural monopolies for a small community, roads, utility, access ways, port, and airport are planned for and provided by the Owl Development Corporation. Uh, there are, however, no legal monopolies. Um, right. And then the last part, the Owl Development Corporation is conceptually and organizationally simple and quite conventional, easy to explain to a prospective investor entrepreneur. So so basically the the, the steps here would be like, um, and this is where, like you say, the cart gets, gets put before the horse, or yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever the phrase is. Um, yeah, that is. That is. Um, so... Uh, like yeah, you can't have the whole. You can't have the free aisles like project like without um like you need probably to start like it, it'd take like a small permanent floating voluntary society um to go find these islands to you know stake them out um to get something started get some self sufficiency going as you say lay the critical infrastructure 
before you could even get to anything entrepreneurial or um, anything competition wise. So, um, yeah, I think you, you make a good point there. It's not even, it's not, it's not, or it's just like it's not, what point. So, so, so in this context, the market competition would, uh, the best utility for the market competition would be more in refining the infrastructure once the infrastructure has been built, right? You want the more efficient road. You want the faster internet connection. You want a higher pressure water, because for some areas in first realm, you don't even get that. You want the higher pressure water. Uh, you want the electricity that's going to stay on and not go kaput the first time there's like a, a slight electrical storm, right? You want, to put it another way, the market competition will get, will, uh, will through creative destruction and a couple other things, uh, market forces of various kinds will eventually to the better quality stuff. In much the same way, to use an analogy, how the Japanese people are infamous for taking pre-existing technology and then uh, optimizing it and making it more resilient, more efficient, and so forth. Same idea here. Um, the real tricky part that kind of everybody's missing is that when you're first setting up, assuming you could pull it off, but let's again, let's let's go uh, let's go half full with this, okay? That if you could set up your free aisle under underwater city, underground city, so forth, um, it, it would have to be cooperative at first. And not only that, I would further suggest, and maybe this is a mutualist uh, element of me talking, to be fair, it would have to be more like a mutual aid society type thing first that would be building the initial infrastructure of whatever it is that you need to sustain life, at least initially. So it would be more like a co-op. It, it would be the free aisle co-op thing to make sure that we have air to breathe, water to drink, a, at least some mi minimal amount of food so we don't starve. It doesn't have to be best quality. It doesn't have to be five-star restaurant. All that stuff comes later through competition. That's later. Right now, we need to make sure we have oatmeal. Does that make sense? Sure. You know, it, it, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like the families heading west on the Oregon Trail or the Yukon Trail or any other trail, right? They're not, nobody's really competing in the Willamette Valley for anything. Right, they're trying just to get there and survive, stake a claim. Yes, that part's true. Stake a claim, but nobody's really competing. If you think about that time in history, nobody, not, as far as I understand it, nobody competed. They were just trying to travel, survive, not die, and then start building the civilization out there, which is basically what happened. And all the competition market stuff happened later. I mean, and yet, to be fair, to use that historical example, there were general stores along the way. So you even had some market activity. You know, there would be some merchants that would be selling some very basic stuff that you need to survive. Oh, you broke a wagon wheel. Well, here's a replacement wheel kind of thing. But nobody's – we're not talking about a, a civilizational um, evolution to the degree that now, oh, well, I'm going to use a first realm example, but we're not talking about something like, oh, you drive a Toyota? Well, I've got a Bugatti. Who gives a crap? We just need cars that function, right? So all the nicer stuff that is a further refinement that, yes, can be a better quality comes later. The stuff that we need to exist comes first. And I would suggest the best way of doing that is not clawing at each other or playing off as politics, or even good old-fashioned market competition where inventor A and inventor B and inventor C have different ways of building a mousetrap, and the market, the customers, decide to go with one of them, and that's, the, and that's the new trend. We basically need to cooperate to survive at first, and then after that we can build a civilization where you can have the luxury of, for example, to use a first-realm example, you can choose between the Toyota versus the Bugatti versus uh, even a Honda or something, right? or whatever the second realm versions of those would be. That stuff comes later. Um, right now, it's basically, let's just cooperate and survive, and then we'll worry about competition later. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, agreed. Yeah, I think that was that was an adequate answer for JJ. Um, I suppose uh, we'll keep it, keep it rolling here. Um, and this is the question where we'll only get 50% of the way through here, and then uh, <clears throat> if there's time today, we'll uh, we'll uh, get to the uh, the private stuff. But... Um, this next one comes from Zaliriak, uh, one of the admins over at the Hack Liberty Forum, uh, which I would definitely recommend folks check out uh, and sign up. Uh, that's forum.hackliberty.org. 
Um, and uh, he asked uh, Rayo to, what is Pazian's position on travel freedom? I'm a big travel freedom advocate, and as a non-statist, I find it very challenging to imagine re renewing my, pa my, my passport from a gang, a monarchy no less. I do not identify with, let alone have any, any loyalty or allegiance toward. Um, so yeah, I understand. Um, certainly get it. Um, so I guess uh, Pazian's position on travel freedom... Um, basically, like uh, like anything else, like the the Pasnia part, um, I know like the Free Republic part might be um, might be uh, uh, confusing as it's intended to be, um, but it's not. Uh, I mean, we aren't. Uh, um, we haven't petitioned the United Nations. We don't have uh, like uh, you couldn't get a Pasnia passport at this time and uh, use it to cross Mex cross any borders or anything like that. Um, therefore, yeah, everything you know, everything is culture gaming purposes, of course, right? Um, so yeah, we we've got souvenir passports as, as any free country or as any new country project should have. Um, you got to sell passports, um, or you aren't legit. So, we want to be legit. We got to sell passports. Um, but again, I, I don't. Uh, they aren't. Uh, um, they aren't legitimate government documents or any any anything of the sort. Um, now, I guess the the to as far as solutions, um, you know, uh, we've talked about. Uh, you know, we talked about. Le there's legal interstices. Um, there's paper tripping, which we talked about a little bit. Um, and there is a. Uh, I guess the my my perspective on these on these strategies now is yeah you know like wouldn't would, wouldn't it be awesome to um well I, I guess yeah I don't know um yeah it'd be awesome to just not to deal with deal with them at all but I guess my my stance now is like uh, um if I were to get if I were to renew my Illinois driver's license like the the way I'm supposed to I would have to go to like two different specialist doctors to do it um for shit like 15 years ago so like it was so it's and and it would just and obviously like they like they, they maybe jump through a bunch of hoops and be like super you know nonsense but um if i can do it and not to go through any other not any other any other shit and avoid coercion that way like they're just legal interstices um so i guess i guess the what i'll say for the public portion is you know look for um there are you know valid and legal ways to obtain um you know obtain these things um I guess just look for uh, unique opportunities um, that may uh, that may be out there, and I will provide more more details later on. But um, I guess uh, yeah, for for inspiration, we've talked about paper tripping before. Um, not something we ne we definitely wouldn't recommend it, but um, it might get you thinking and, and kind of in that direction. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know what. And any thoughts on that, Kyle? So a disclaimer first. When it comes to the seldom talked about, but I would even so far as to say highly, <laughs> um, a highly, uh, it's not even divisive, it's controversial notion of paper tripping. The disclaimer is this. The original theory and practice of paper tripping was that you could uh, basically create wholesale a legal identity that is separate and distinct from whatever that you had since uh, birth that, that your parents or other uh, caretakers essentially uh, bequeathed to you, um, and that all of this is legal and above board, but it's just an unusual application of creating a wholesale new legal identity, uh, complete with social security number and driver's licenses and, and so forth. Now, that being said, much like with laws and legal interstices in general, lawyers and their laws change. Added on top of that, especially ever since 9-11, there's been a tightening up of various different statutes and all that, where to my understanding, it's not impossible to paper trip, it's just gotten a lot more difficult and there's less options. One other part of the disclaimer is that in terms of testing any of this, there's a bit of a catch-22. And the catch-22 is simply this. If you experiment with a method and the method does not pan out, it does not work, or even if it worked in the past, let's say pre-9-11, and it doesn't work now, post-9-11, then technically there's not really a bad, most people don't, but technically there's not really any reason to not talk about it publicly, especially if it's a failure more as a warning to other people, hey, don't do this, right? Uh, especially if it's don't do this in a particular uh, legal jurisdiction, right? So unless you're going to play jurisdictional arbitrage, which is its own separate thing, um, it's more, hey, I tried this, it didn't work, you know, pass it on kind of thing. Now, here's where the catch-22 starts to come into play, especially. Let's say a technique worked, a very specific technique in a very specific place, in a very specific way. That it did turn out to be 100% legal, just that it was just an unusual application of it, and in such a way that your run-of-the-mill status would absolutely detest for their own separate reasons. <laughs> if a technique works, do you really want to talk about it publicly? 
Because I don't have a good answer to that question. That is really the more profound question. If a te- paper tripping technique works, do we really want to talk about it publicly? Absolutely. Not. I mean, maybe. Not in my. Not in my. Right. Ma- so, in in the in the terms of like strategy versus tactics, in that way. Yes. Um, but not. Uh, yeah, definitely not. And that, that that's where I'm at now. It's like, yeah, forget. Um, yeah, that for yeah, forget. Yeah, forget that. Because right. unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, it is right, and I'm glad you said that because unfortunately, it is quickly running into the territory of what would essentially be the equivalent of a professional or trade secret, or to put it in military parlance, uh, it's either infosec or ops or something along those lines. It's neat to know, and so like publicly talking about a paper tripping technique failure is one thing. Yep. But talking about a paper tripping success, hmm. Like, there's a part of me that wants to. If, so, if, like, somebody else tries something in a work, part of me wants to talk about it publicly. But then I think, you know what? <sighs> Would talking about it publicly do more harm than good? Would it put not just that person, but anyone else coming after him at risk of being persecuted by the state for doing something that is technically legal? Because that is the insanity of the world that we now inhabit, where even if you do things that are legal, even according to the status legal nonsense, their own interstices, you could still be persecuted or prosecuted as the case may be. And that's, that's, that's the, that's, that is the crux of the issue right there. And yes, Shane, I'm inclined to agree with you more often than not that if there is a paper tripping success, it is going to have to be neat to know that we shouldn't talk about it publicly. And that would be the type of thing that should be you know, either in person or over encrypted channels at most or that kind of thing. Because even though we're, even though we're abiding by the law and there is nothing illegal with that, that anyone is doing, nobody's engaging in, in so-called identity theft. Exactly. Nobody is doing any, there's no fraud. More importantly, there's no fraud. There's no fraud. There's no nothing. Even if it's 100% legal, which is what paper tripping has always been about, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because certain statists have made up their minds that they're going to just prosecute or persecute anybody who tries to gain any semblance of freedom, no matter how well you exploit certain interstices. And so, like, for, so like for example, we can talk about some interstices, oh, excuse me, the successes of some interstices publicly. You know, I've written about reclaiming unclaimed property. Um, right. I, you know, there was the whole case of the voter registration thing we did a while back. Um, we, we can talk, now, that, those things aren't paper tripping, to be clear. But, like, there's some stuff we can talk about that are successes because it doesn't get anybody in trouble. But for some reason, and something I've noticed over the years, Shane, and, and maybe you and I should talk about this uh, privately later, but it's just weird that I've noticed that when it comes to paper tripping specifically, all kinds of state has come out of the fucking woodwork. And even a couple of them, I've known um, – details of this should be for private conversation, but I've known some people that try to get friends of mine in trouble with the cops, and the cops investigated and found out that nothing illegal happened, and they just dropped it. So there's some other weird – you could call it deep state. I don't know if that's necessarily applicable here, but there's some other weird thing I don't fully understand where statists have a real issue with people doing paper tripping. And funny enough, as a corollary to this, notice how the so-called oxymoronic sovereign citizens are dealt with because those guys will straight up do illegal stuff, which is why they don't like me because I call them out on it, like I did years ago. Um, so that's, that's something to, to kind of ponder is why is the paper tripping suddenly, uh, or not suddenly, it's been over time, but why is that considered person- like the equivalent of persona non grata, but the sovereign citizens, oh, yeah, well, or American state national or whatever new fraud they're doing, uh, they, 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 they're the acceptable scapegoat. Even the state, even the various statists don't like them. But, like, their stuff is kind of obvious fraud type stuff. I mean, what the hell is straw man redemption? Like, I know what that is. It's basically just a form of fraud. But... It's interesting, even though paper tripping is legal, when it's done correctly and all that, they, they just want to clamp the boot down. And I think that says a lot. I think it says a lot where there's this assumption where your garden variety status don't want anyone to have the freedom to reinvent their own identity. Reminds, that, me, of, I think reminds me of the right to not be forgotten stuff you talked about like over a damn decade uh-huh. ago. Yeah, and, and especially considering the old American tradition of where you move to a different part of the country and you essentially reinvent yourself. Now, back in like 
the you know 19th century, you could do that given the technological capabilities of the time, and nobody would really question it. And yes, sometimes some criminals did that. Sure, you can abuse anything, but there were also people who weren't criminals that did the same thing for their own set of reasons. So I, I just find it telling that the Orwellian total state surveillance state apparatus really doesn't want anyone to not just escape their past, but detach from their past, which, by the way, for some people is actually the mentally healthy thing to do, especially mm-hmm. if they grew up like, with a toxic family and all that. So there's also kind of like the mental health aspect of this, where, yeah, sometimes you really, some people really do need to separate themselves from their past, even legally. You know, uh, but, but and, and even if it is legal for them to do it, the fact that they would get uh, grief over it from, from garden variety status, yeah. is absolutely appalling. It's actually, it's actually anti-American, strictly speaking. But apparently that's the norm nowadays. No one is allowed to escape their past or reinvent themselves, even if it's above board, even if there's no fraud involved or criminal activity, even according to the state's own law. You are not allowed to start over. And that, I think, has quite profound implications for mental health and, and our personal freedoms and a couple other things. Never mind the whole invulnerability to coercion thing that, you know, this podcast is all about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess the, um, what's, uh, what's sticking, sticking in my mind now is <clears throat> as far as, um, you know, I, I love open sourcing things. Um, obviously like there's no paywall behind any of the Bonnie podcast material or anything. Like there's nothing that I do that's behind a paywall. Um, but, uh, yeah. And these, in these circumstances, it's, it's literally like if I guess, uh, to, to choose my words, um, carefully here if i don't know if i well yeah anyway um yeah won't even won't even, won't even go there but um yeah it's it's the it's a fact that like this the, for the for the, for an inner size to be available um to people um you know whether uh you know for just personal desire or if there's like an actual need like and kyle you, you mentioned like the uh, you know like the the new underground railroad like my money to you know bring that back you know make money to make that a thing um at some point well some of these legal under might be necessary like to keep around um because yeah, if, if uh, you know if some of these things are all utilized and you know too quickly, um, and uh, something that's never really been done before gets done like twenty times in like the span of like, a couple months, um, they notice those things. Um, they definitely do. So especially when it comes to this area. So um, yeah, I th- yeah. I, I guess that, that's all I really have to say on this one. But uh, at, any other uh, comments on uh, travel freedom, legal interstices, paper tripping, etc. I would just say this. I mean, when it comes to like travel freedom in particular, yeah, strictly speaking, if we're talking like deontological natural rights theory and all that, yes, of course you have the right to travel. It's called walking, um, among other forms of you know, of pro- propulsion through space, right? Um, and I'm not being glib about this, guys. I'm just simply saying, yes, of course you have a right to travel, and. Um, I guess even to some degree have a right to life, I, I suppose. Um, but I think where the rubber meets the road with a lot of this is that, you know, there's the old adage about, and I do agree with this, even though it's technically from a status source, you know, the courts and common law rulings and such things, is that, you know, your rights and, you know, <laughs> basically my rights end at the beginning of your nose kind of thing. Right, a lot of this stuff has to be negotiated to to, to greater or lesser extent. Now, yes, there are a couple of the thou shalt not, if we're going to go kind of to use a religious connotation. But aside from a few of the thou shalt not, which, by the way, the state is all too happy to violate, uh, please see definitions of what is democide, right? Um, Aside from stuff like that, a lot of this other stuff can be either contracted or negotiated, I mean, a completely stateless society, it would largely run on contract. Mm-hmm. It would have to. Now, that would mean that, yes, some situations would be contracted that would restrict people's freedom, voluntarily or not. But at least you would kind of have a possible way of getting out of it, some sort of opt-out clause or exchanging one set of contracts for another or something, right? You at least have some degree of choice. You could even argue that it's the stateless society version of jurisdictional arbitrage. Not exactly the same thing, but the idea where you could like switch sets of rules, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but but here's the other thing too. Um, 
you do have a right to travel. You do not have a right to gasoline. You do not have a right to a conveyance with four wheels, a chassis, and an internal combustion engine. You do not have a right to an airplane. You do not have a right to any of these things. These are things you're going to have to negotiate and contract and buy and maybe even take a loan out on, much like I did recently with one thing. So, yes, you can move yourself through space. Uh, absolutely. From the time you can crawl and walk to until the day you're six feet under, or maybe even sooner if you have mobility issues, uh, elderly, if you're fortunate enough to live that long. But the tools that you use, the equipment, the conveyances you use to propel yourself through space, you have to earn those or be gifted them or it's, it's some sort of contract type thing. And no, I'm not peripherally arguing for some sort of like driver's license of any kind because that stuff's awful for other reasons. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there is such a thing as negative liberty and, the, and then there's the oxymoronic positive liberty stuff. And the negative liberty thing is that, no, you cannot interfere with my right to travel in terms of moving myself from between spaces, right? I, you know, it, it is, so like the whole notion of a traffic stop, for instance, is an infringement uh, on, on negative liberty, if you will. It is. It is completely stated, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of the colors of the lights of the, of the police patrol car that is forcing you to stop. And believe you me, I've had more of those this year than, than, than previous years, which is another reason this year for me has been crazier more so than usual, not the stuff in my personal life and professional too. I, I think I've been pulled over like, what, at least four times at least. I, I, I'm starting to lose count. It's gotten that bad. Um, thankfully, not so much recently within the past three weeks, but over the past several months, yeah. It, it, but that, that's an infringement on negative liberty, obviously. But unfortunately, I think a lot of people, especially the, the minarchists, allegedly limited government types, they take right to travel in the negative liberty, in the pure negative liberty sense, and they kind of uh, start going into kind of a positive liberty, you could even say leftist direction, where, <laughs> you know, well, you can't impound my car. Well, sir, um, depending, did you freaking run over that grandma over there? Oh, you did. Oh, you admit it. Oh, see, now we have other issues, right? Because you didn't have a right to fucking mow down that grandma with your car. You see what I mean? Oh, yeah. Now, yes, there are other times where there's some sort of BS data thing going on. And then, yeah, you would have to do without a case-by-case -case basis. But there are times to take someone's car keys, rip it out of their hands, and throw it down the drain before they freaking kill somebody because they're an irresponsible drunk or they're looking at their phone or doing something that puts other people at risk. And no, this is not an excuse. A uh, back, uh, you know, around uh, a reach around excuse, if you will, <laughs> phrasing. This isn't a reach around excuse for the uh, for the state to start doing getting involved in quality of life stuff. I'm just simply saying, use your common sense, right? If somebody is 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 being is acting in a manner that is threatening to you, you have every right to defend yourself from drunks, from inattentive drivers, and whomever else. I'm not saying you need to use a pit maneuver and, and crunch into the rear axle, okay? Let the cops do that if they choose to do that. Or maybe in some circumstances, maybe you really do need to. I'm not going to advise you either way. I'm not a lawyer. I don't give legal advice. I don't play one on TV, okay? I'm just simply saying, especially when it comes to the conveyances and technology and equipment that you use to propel yourself through space, again, your rights end the fender of your car ends when you basically are crunching into somebody else. And I hate to say this, but this was the original reason behind car insurance, which I wrote about in the uh, extra constitutional series a while back. But unfortunately there was like a status overlay with how they passed laws because they, the courts got overwhelmed with insurance claims and all that. So unfortunately, as much as the anarcho capitalists would hate me saying this, I'm sorry, but insurance companies can't solve all problems, status or not. But, yeah, I mean, this is just something to think about. Yes, you have a right to travel. You do not have the right to use your conveyance. They use the right to travel to hurt people. That's all I'm saying. Don't violate the non-aggression principle with your car. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, all, all good, good and valuable information. Uh, so we got about seven, uh, six, seven minutes left here. And uh, this last one, um, I think uh, it's, it's the, there are two different questions, but same theme. So I'll read them both here. Um, but the first one was a question I saw on the Agora podcast chat on Telegram. Um, that's uh, yeah, we should uh, we should uh, 
respond to, at least you, you, you especially first. Um, but uh, it was in reference to uh, everyone's social, socialist and security numbers uh, plus other personal data being leaked as a result of a recent hack. Uh, they didn't even have the shit encrypted. Who would have thought? And Kyle, you, you and I both know how easy it is to use encryption. It's absolutely fucking wild. Um, it's like uh, losing data. It's like you realize how much a two terabyte external hard drive costs. Um, you know, you can just like copy everything on there four or five times and never lose anything ever again. Um, like it's it's really that easy. But no, they lost, uh, you know, there's a hack and somehow they lost uh, everyone's social and security numbers. And uh, an individual asked in response to this, uh, how to improve operational security or OPSEC. Um, and a similar question here. Um, I got another question from uh, Josiah in our SimpleX chat. Uh, he commented that he'd like to hear a topic uh, regarding your book, uh, or I guess regarding, he'd, he'd like to hear, uh, I guess, some a comment on your book uh, just below the surface, a guide to security culture, since much of it is still high, highly relevant for venuans uh, and self liberators. So, um, I guess uh, the couple of questions which might be able to be answered in a similar similar manner. Um, how to improve operational security, and uh, you wrote a book called Just Below the Surface, A Guide to Security Culture. Um, I guess uh, the two are definitely interrelated, so yeah, I guess uh, um, I'll leave it, leave, it, leave it open there for you. Okay, so I would, just say this. I would just say this. So I've become very skeptical about cybersecurity issues, whether we're talking in a first realm context, or even in a second realm context where we have the, the digital encryption of, for example, PGP for email, um, ZRCP for, for VoIP calls, and uh, the other ones that I can't remember right offhand. Um, here's the thing. These encryption methods, generally speaking, they work, especially if they use public key cryptography and so forth. The problem is people don't want to use them. Whether you attribute that to laziness or you attribute it to inertia, which seems to be even more common than laziness, Unfamiliarity is also related to that, to the inertia and so forth. Um, I mean, how, how many even Zoomers who would be your early adopters, or at least most free or more common adopters? How many, how many of them are using um, encrypted SMS texting uh, unless it's like somehow automatic? If it's automatic, then of course they're going to use it by default. But if it's not by default, if they have to install something, it's like, oh, I can't be bothered kind of thing. Or I don't have time, or I'm too busy. But I'll spend 40 hours a week on Instagram taking pictures of my ass because I've had to deal with first round people like that, even, even, even like the other month. So it's like, okay, so it's not that you're too busy, it's that you don't prioritize this. You don't care about your privacy. Of the people that choose to do that, that's basically what they're telling me and everyone else. And of course, if they're taking pictures of their ass on Instagram, obviously they don't care very much about their privacy in general because I'm a model. I had people tell me that in person, by the way, when I was working a um, – when I was working a, a plain clothes assignment, by the way, I could literally come up to me, I'm a model. I'm like, really, which agency do you work with? And because um, that's normal, modeling agency, right? That's a normal thing. And they said, no, 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 I can have my account on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like, motherfucker, this is, that's not being a model. Maybe I'm just getting old, but like a model had to like work for an agency and then you would either show up in like a Sears catalog or, you know, the Victoria's Secret catalog with like nudge nudge fellas. Or, you know, whatever, whatever else. Oh, well, you don't right? get it, Kyle. Instagram uh, hired her to be a model. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't exist. So, um, maybe you see what I mean, right? Um, you know, by, by their fruits, ye shall know them. I'm not trying to get in the habit of quoting the Bible every other minute, but there are some life lessons and experiences that kind of translate almost yeah. one to one. Almost one to one. Again, you don't have to be of that particular religion, but kind of like you can pull some stuff out of the hadith and other religious texts. That, again, that's more about um, that's more experiential than anything else. If you live long enough, you've, you've, you've kind of seen some shit and been involved in some shit and so forth. So maybe some stuff you're not even proud of. Um, but I guess that's how we all learn and grow, I suppose. But again, in terms of again invulnerability coercion, um, you need to be using encryption. Uh, at least when it comes to your telecommunications and your digital stuff and so forth. And also in learning how to encrypt files. And of course, the more streamlined that it, that it gets, I just think the greater the adaptability will be. Um, that being said, all the encrypt, and, and sorry, this is a, this is a caveat. And if, if nobody's going to take anything else away from this one uh, question or answer to the question, this is the one sentence I need everyone to pay attention to. Because having written the book on security culture, quite literally, this is kind of a hinging thing, at least for this particular question. So here it is. Here's the caveat. I need everybody to like take five seconds and just listen to me for a second, even if you don't listen to me for the next couple minutes. Here it is. If 
you do not practice any sort of good informational security outside of computers, outside of telecommunications, just in your own life with how you talk to people, like in person, if you don't practice good InfoSec, all the technology in the world will not save your ass mm -hmm. or keep your privacy or any stuff like that. Put another way, if you are a gossip, and I've come across some people that I've got work, and I'll tell you about them privately about it later, some more of the blow-by-blow -blow insider baseball if you want to hear it, whether later today or tomorrow, whatever, or, or, or later. But if you were a gossip, everybody, listen, this is important. If you were a gossip and you prattle on about somebody's dirty laundry, regardless of whether it's true or not, um, all the encryption in the world will not save you when you get your comeuppance, inevitably. Okay? Is that, is that clear to everybody? If you run your mouth when you shouldn't, you are going to get in trouble. Is that clear? So not all forms of technology are going to save you if you don't even have some basic common sense, if you don't have discretion, and most importantly, if you don't have any kind of discernment. If you don't have discernment, you don't have security culture of any kind. Is that clear? Now, I say all that because I think this is something that a lot of people kind of miss, whether it's from the book or some episodes we've done and so forth, where they think there's this kind of assumption they've created for themselves. And this has come up in private conversations mainly uh, that have some people's shame, where they make this assumption that if they get all the technology and they do the PGP or they do the, well, freaking whatever, right? They use public key cryptography correctly, that everything will be fine, everything is magical and mystical but then they go on Twitter and they blab about shit. doesn't matter what the content is. Or, more to the point, they go to somebody at work and blab about stuff they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Now, the context of that is, I'm not going to say it here publicly, but let's just say, just keep it simple, keep it ambiguous, it's stuff they really shouldn't be blabbing about. All that technological stuff doesn't count for shit at that point because they literally just shot themselves in the foot. I'm not saying everybody needs to act like a foreign intelligence officer, i.e. a spy. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying you need to have discernment in terms of what even a lot of people in the first realm status, so-called intelligence community would correctly, one thing I am agreeing with them about, would correctly identify as need to know versus need to share. Yeah. Need to share is where you're basically running your mouth. Need to know is the complete opposite. If you're practicing good security culture, you're doing need to know. If you run your mouth, you're doing need to share. And you know, there and by the way, there is a time and a place to share. There is a time and a place to not necessarily gossip, but you know, preach. Preach. I mean how what do you think what do you hey hell, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think we're doing here? This isn't in some sense, this isn't really need to know. This is all public you know, this is need to share very much so. Yep. That's what podcasting is. Yep. Fundamentally, ask, ask Joe Rogan. Ask a lot of the, the top podcasters in the world. All they do is need to share, which is fine. There's a time and a place for that. But you see with the kind of the paradox where if we're talking about certain techniques of need to know and good security culture, we can only talk about a certain degree. Hell, see the previous answer I just gave about the friggin' paper tripping, mm -hmm. right? I had to be very careful about what I said. Yeah, yeah. I might have, to be honest, I might have even said too much. Only history is going to judge me on that one. And I might have said too but little. That's, so that's I'd rather do that. <laughs> Yeah, but, that, but see, that's my point, though, is that even if I make a tactical mistake, excuse me, let me rephrase. Oh, see, I made a mistake right there. <laughs> even if I make a strategic mistake right now on this very episode, this very podcast, where I say maybe a little too much, that is an error. That would have been an error on my part where it's more one of refinement. That is not the same kind of gross error where people are just, unabashedly just running their mouth with the first thought that hits their consciousness. Okay? That's not okay. Where you're just airing dirty laundry and sharing intimate details about what came out of your ass and into the toilet, which people do not need to know except for very, very few people. Like your doctor, for instance, would probably need to know that if it was like in the context of visiting your doctor. But, like, not everybody and their uncle needs to know that kind of detail. There is such a thing as TMI, is what I'm trying to say. 
But unfortunately, Shane and some people don't have that kind of discernment where they can't distinguish between the types of, inf of information in their noggin about do I talk about this or do I talk or do I not talk about that? They don't even go through that selection, that very basic There's selection no process about what to make. Sorry, there's no filtering. Right, and that lack of filtering is a major issue. I come across it all the damn time, and maybe it's partially the nature of my prof uh, profession in the first realm, and maybe it's partially some people I hang out with. But it is something I am noted. I mean, even back when I thought I was happily married, it was still something I came across too with people I knew back even last year. People like back then, and back in the younger years, you know, whatever. Okay, I'm being a little bit facetious, but you know what I mean. Different people, different times, different experience I've had. It is a recurring theme I've noticed that regardless of my own personal situation, people around me really have a tough time filtering. They really, really do. Like, there will be like one or two or three or five people that, are actually, that I trust that are pretty good about having a good filter. But that filter itself is a practice of good security culture, ladies and gentlemen. And so, no, I am not, again, doing a reach around, eh, phrasing. This is not a reach around way of basically uh, uh, advocating some sort of censorship, right? Censorship is what despotic governments do, although that is a redundant notion of because governments are despotic by definition, of course. This isn't something like this government does because, oh, yeah, we want to do a book burning because we don't like what somebody said about evolution or some sort of topic, right, or criticizing our, our great dear leaders of fill-in-the-blank, uh, chairman, whomever the hell, right, or president or prime minister, king, whomever, right? Um, this, this is more – how do I say this? This is more an issue of people not using their brains. And this is a really scary part, Shane. And this is also something else I want people to pay attention to. If somebody has such loose lips that they very well could sink the ship or at least have the capacity to sink the ship due to loose lips about things that don't sink the ship yet but could in the future because let, said lips are loose, because as the old World War II phrase goes, loose lips sink ships, that's where that comes from, for those of you who don't know. If somebody has said lips that are loose, would you really trust them when, shall we say, there's an incident? And now you have to make a lot of fast decisions quickly so you come out the other side of it at least kind of okay. Right. Right. This is coming down to an issue of vetting people as well, which is also part of security culture as well. So anyway, to more answer the question, hopefully in a little bit shorter way. Um, I mean, shut, shut, I, like, I, I, I always say operate like operational security, or private, like security culture, or privacy, like for where, you know, shut the fuck up. Or like if you just operate off that principle, you're right. probably good. But yeah, go ahead with your more right. yeah, elaborate answer. Yes. No, no, no. No, it was, no, it was basically that. It, it's oh. pretty much. I mean, I know I talk a lot. You talk a lot. Right. We're doing need to share right now. But when we're getting the brass tacks about some stuff that that is actually uh, sensitive or even potentially sensitive. Um, you know, there's a reason why there's the old practice of, you know, take the cell phone, uh, take the batteries out of the cell phone, go to a different room, what kind of people are, like, there, there's a reason for all that kind of stuff. That's not crazy. Even the even people in the first realm have been doing that for a couple of years now, at least. So, again, it comes down to discernment. Uh, what you say to somebody, how you say to somebody, and all that um, is very, very important. And, oh, by the way, something else I've noticed, too. People who like to play games of office politics actually have an unusual high amount of discernment. The problem is, is that they twist that otherwise valuable skill, indispensable skill actually, towards evil ends, where they try to manipulate people and turn them against each other, and you know, kind of like what uh, certain psychologists refer to as that dark triad. Um, they would use their their dark triad traits to basically uh, hurt people in that way. And, yeah, they would gossip, but not gossip in, like, a careless way, which is what I've been railing about just over these past couple minutes, which itself is a violation of security culture, obviously. But they would, they would gossip in such a way where they try to, like, hurt people so distrust, which is actually what agent provocateurs and, shall we say, at least historically, co-intel uh, co pro types do. Mm -hmm. um, but, again, it's more of a provocateur thing. So that, that's all I'm kind of getting at is – Use your discernment. Be careful about what you say to certain people and all that. And yes, and, and here's the other thing, too. If somebody betrays your trust, that's one thing, right? And maybe you should have trusted them. Maybe you shouldn't have trusted them. But if somebody betrays your trust, 
you know, try to do damage control to the extent that you can. But again, a lot of this is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, very much so. So if something is like potentially sensitive, only involve the people that need to be involved. I mean, really, whatever it is. I mean, legal or illegal. Um, you know, you don't, and again, just even, even the more legal stuff, going back to the paper tripping just for a minute. You don't need to blab to everybody and their uncle and, and the son if a certain technique works. If you know it works, then you know it works. That was a specific journey or mini, miniature journey for you alone to take, and you get your answer. Doesn't mean you have to scream it from the rooftop either. Right. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, the only thing I was going to say real quick was, the only, just to reiterate, you can have all the best technology encryption in the world, but if you don't have basic social skills like when to talk and when not to talk, security, you're not practicing good security culture at all. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a hugely important answer. Yeah, because um, I, I guess my my very very short answer covers some of the a lot of the digital stuff, but. Um, I guess just at foundationally, um, whether we're talking digitally um, or physically, um, remaining as invisible as possible or at least blending in as much as possible or not doing things that make you stand out, um, whatever that happens to be in the situation and circumstance. But, um, yeah, I guess day-to-day day, day -day stuff, if, if people are looking for, you know, very, you know, easy, you know, I guess just like some steps, some quick steps, they want a, you know, a list of things. Uh, get off social media. That's a good, good first step. Uh, minimize first round banking as much as possible. Um, I understand you might have to have a bank account or something um, for whatever. Um, but yeah, only have one. Don't have like six or seven. Uh, when browsing uh, the internet, do it via VPN and or Tor. Uh, Ghost phone makes this easy. And the next one, which I obviously have a, a vested interest in to at least some degree, um, get a ghost phone. A ghost pad, singular or plural. Um, you know, start segregating your activities amongst them um, in the di digital realm. Um, more generally, do business and interact with individuals you trust. Um, barter. Um, versus, uh, you know, barter, even over using cryptocurrency, something like Monero or Bitcoin that leaves a trail, um, you know, barter is, uh, you know, it's, it's historical. It's, it's always been a, a very, you know, very useful thing and it can be for us too. Um, use Monero, um, or, you know, I guess yeah, I can't, I, you know, at this point I say use Monero because Samurai Wallet, um, Whirlpool is not, uh, um, not in operation. So, um, I can't really recommend, like, I actually, you know, just like, yeah, hold it, hold it. Um, and you know, I guess, I don't know, there, there are ways to get it, spend it. Maybe Bitcoin Lightning is, um, a possibility, but, um, anyway, uh, continuing on, don't politically, don't politically say that it's one very great way to violate your operational security and security culture and privacy and all that. Um, on the same note, don't work with conventional activist organizations or really any formal organization. Um, goes back to everything Kyle was basically talking about with gossip. I mean, a lot of those organizations are just gossip and um, people get in trouble um, at those places. Um, try not to have your name tied to um, any one physical address that you live or reside at. And uh, I guess to just to conclude briefly, combine with that, live a nomadic lifestyle uh, if you can or desire. So um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's you know, use pseudonyms, obviously. Um, that's a you know some foundational of Anu, but um, yeah, I guess that those were some some tactics you laid out of you. Know, I guess strategically, Kyle, um, very very good. Um, it's like uh, yeah, that was a um, very wise answer, very good answer. Um, but uh, I guess any any other closing thoughts? I've been going for a little longer than what uh, we've been what we've been aiming for. But um, I'll uh, uh, any closing thoughts before I I guess kind of wrap this up. Yeah, just in conclusion, just keep thinking. I mean, this is bonding, invulnerability to coercion. So think about what your actions are and just try to gauge it using some common sense. Does this increase or decrease my attempts to be more invulnerable to coercion? And again, mean time to harassment, MTH, all that kind of stuff. Just, just think about things before you just carelessly do stuff. And I'll just leave it there for now. Right on, brother. Right on. Um, well, it was amazing, uh, amazing to uh, to connect as always. And uh, for the the I guess the second part of the first question and the entire second question, um, which I want to get your uh, for the second question, I want to get your thoughts on, especially specifically, Kyle. Um, then uh, um, yeah, we'll we'll save that for for another time. And uh, that that might just be we we haven't done a private episode in a while. Uh, maybe that'll be a short you know fifteen thirty minute one we can um, do uh, do here at some point. Um, so yeah, that is uh, that is on the way. Um, but uh, there you have it. Uh, the first Q&A episode uh, of the podcast in quite a long time. I think since like 2018 even. Um, of course, any questions that come up uh, in the future, please do pass them along. Uh, email Shane at LibertyAttack.com uh, or DM wherever is convenient. Uh, these episodes are fun and uh, 
yeah, I don't know. You guys have a lot of a lot of cool thoughts, and you're doing your own you're doing your own stuff. So, um, always always do love to hear from you guys. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, that's it. Sorry, let's see here. Um, so yeah, I guess to to close out real quick, please do check out Libertarian Type Publications for books, bundles, strategy guides, uh, health and wellness tools, and now El Uguay Pub Records, <laughs> featuring two albums by the legendary Richard Greaser. Uh, two albums will give our reactions and reviews to uh, in a future podcast. Um, really, really amazing stuff, Kyle. Um, as in terms of the culture jamming, um, we will uh, at some point we'll we'll do a we'll just like we're doing now. We'll do a live listen and react um, to uh, to uh, this is what I now this is what I call defiance by Richard Greaser and the and Bitcoin Bugle. Um, it's really, really amazing culture jamming uh, in the music realm. Um, but uh, yeah, that is available at Limit Type Publications now too. And uh, if you are a music like again, like I didn't. Never would have thought I'd enter this realm, but yeah, if you, uh, um, I can get music on Spotify and like 25 of their outfits now. So, um, if there are any, you know, music musicians out there that want to, uh, you know, get their music out, get their music out there on those platforms, um, uh, but want to get paid in Bitcoin or Monero, uh, no KYC, uh, then, uh, that service is available, uh, at libertyattack.com as well. Um, thanks so much for your time today. Hope to see, uh, hope to see many of you in Veritas for Vani Fest in the very near future. September 30th to October 7th are these specific dates. Cheers, guys. Thanks for tuning in. LUA Pub Records presents the most inspirational alternative band in the world, Richard Greaser and The Bugle, featuring the first credentialed journalist, songwriter, and producer. Is he the next Leonardo da Vinci? No, he's just a man who smokes a lot of cigarettes and has a bachelor's in journalism. With great inspirational songs like The Princess and the Podcast Listener. I need a prince charming to save me from life. The hit track, Non-Compliant 1776. This one-of-a-kind album titled Now That's What I Call Defiance is filled with instant classics. This album is not available in stores and limited digital quantities are available, so order now. Visit libertyunderattack.com slash bugle music to order today. Hello friends, fellow self-liberators. Dr. Gatherer here coming to you with a health and wellness message. The Pain Liberator, Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever, is now back in stock at libertyunderattack.com. For your basic aches and pains, to more extensive injuries, and even pains like headaches or migraines, the Pain Liberator is here to liberate you from discomfort. The Pain Liberator is a 20% DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide slash 80% colloidal silver water base blended with enough aspirin to provide 30 milligrams of aspirin per spray. Beyond just pain relief, all three of these main ingredients provide enormous benefit to the body in general. DMSO also helps to bring the aspirin and colloidal silver into the skin for maximum bioavailability. Individual benefits include colloidal silver, is antibacterial, antifungal, used for sore throats, sinus problems, tooth infections, and candida overgrowths. DMSO has over 40 known pharmacological properties, helps with acne, heals shingles, is radio slash EMF protective, painkiller, and heals stroke and heart attack damage. Aspirin is one of the safest, cheapest miracle drugs in existence. Searching PubMed, it assists with basically every disease or imbalance, from muscle pain to reversing cancerous tumors and everything in between. Spray directly on head for headaches. The Pain Liberator is available via Liberty Under Attack publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com slash pain to place your order today. PayPal, Bitcoin, and Monero accepted. For Monero, email shane at libertyunderattack.com. The Pain Liberator Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever, a Pasnia Department of Health and Wellness Creation. Liberty Under Attack at com slash pain.